Shrimp. Uh, oh, jeez. Shrimp. Um, yeah, that's that's what I am. So sorry. Shrimp. Ugh. Uh, okay, I'm. I'm just gonna go now. <laughs> <sighs> the Gen 3 Fossil Pokemon. Oh great, yet another rock water type fossil Pokemon. Based on a creature that's long since dead. Actually, while very aquatic and capable of many water moves, I'm rock bug type. And blown out. And a plant. That can't even face the right direction. Like, what do you even do? Well, a lot, apparently. Lilip and Cradily are pretty stinking cool once you start, like, looking into them. Whereas with Anorith and Armaldo... Like, Anorith it is so very cute. It is easily my favorite of the fossil Pokémon. I mean, look at it! It's an adorable cartoon shrimpy! And that's the problem. That's about all it has going for it, but we'll get to it later. Let's start with Lilip. Lilip is regenerated from the root fossil because it's a plant. Except it's not, that's a lie. While yes, it is grass type, so maybe in the Pokemon world it has plant-like biological structure, the real world things that it is based on are not plants at all. Though, I get it. They do look very plant-like, and they plant themselves to the same spot on the ground for most of their lives, like plants tend to do. But no, the main thing Lilip is based on is a class of marine animals called crinoids. They're a part of the phylum Echidnoderm. That sounds like whatever lotion Knuckles the Echidna uses. Hang on. Echidnoderm, and they are actually most closely related to starfish, brittle stars, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. Which is pretty interesting. You would think sea anemone, but no. These blippity doodads have been around since the Ordovician period, about 480 million years ago, which is why I'm a bit confused as to why Lilip and Cradily lived only as far back as 100 million years ago, according to their Pokedex entries while other fossil non, like the Kabuto line, mentions it being alive 300 million years ago. Curious. Perhaps they wanted to keep Kabuto as a super early fossil Pokémon in the Pokémon evolution timeline. So even though these guys would realistically be older, they're not. Okay. But here's a question. Why are they even fossil Pokémon? There are plenty of Pokémon based on ancient and extinct animals that aren't a member of the fossil club, and, as I stated in my Gen 1 Fossil Pokemon Explained video, both of those guys are two of the most common fossils in the world and are incredibly important to our understanding of paleontology and or paleobiology as a whole. So you'd think they'd want to follow that up with some other super iconic fossils, right? So what's so special about these hentai plants that aren't even plants? Well, while these days there are about 600 living species of crinoid, the class was significantly more diverse and prolific in the past. There are some thick limestone beds that date back to the mid-Paleozoic to Jurassic eras that are almost entirely made up of disarticulated crinoid fragments. What does that mean in English? Well, come along, kids. We're gonna go along for a ride to Imagination Land. Imagination. So, imagine a giant puddle of people corpses. Let's keep it, let's keep it a bit, a bit nicer. Imagine, if you will, a giant pile of people skeletons. Okay, I'm on board. How big we talking? Enough to fill entire valleys. Nice. And then all those skeletons get densely packed together over time and crushed into the sediment, forming an entire bed made of mostly skeleton metal. And uncomfortable sounding, I know I couldn't sleep on a bed made of stone and bone. I could barely even sleep on my old worn out mattress. Do you ever wake up feeling like your skeleton has gotten crushed into the sediment? Or that you've been laying on bedrock for hours? Then maybe it's time for a new mattress. Like one of these from today's sponsor, Helix Sleep. Praise be. But they have so many options, how do I choose? Well, with their online sleep quiz, of course, which will match you and a partner to your perfect mattress. I'm a back sleeper, and I've had my Helix Midnight Lux for over three years now, and it's still great. And I still fondly remember the day it first arrived. 
It was a surprisingly small box that was easy to move around. Good lord, how was it fitting in there? With these small dimensions delivered directly to my door and brought entirely into the studio? Well, because it's vacuum sealed. And what's extra great is that just in case you don't think it's your perfect mattress, you can still try it for 100 nights to be sure. And if it's still not perfect, the returning process is easy. You don't need an industrial mattress sucker to reduce its girth to fit it back in the box, because Helix makes it easy. They'll not only pick it up, but they'll also give you a full refund. Get it? There's, there's the pun in there, because full is also a mattress size. <whistles> Puns aside, they even have a 10-year warranty. What? Warranty. And with financing options and flexible payment plans, a great night's sleep is never far away. Especially because when you visit the link in the description, helixsleep.com slash Loxton, you can get up to $200 off and two free pillows. How easy! How nice! How soft! Also, my cat likes the box. Maybe your cat will like the box too. Now where were we? Oh yes! Beds made almost entirely out of animal bones because once upon a time there were so many of them. And thanks to there being so many, we can use their fossils as a lens through which we can see what the local ocean was like at whatever specific period and location we find them in. Which I would consider being very important to our understanding of ancient history. Good job, buddy! You did it! That was very helpful of you. To die. A lot. Now, the adult crinoids who attached themselves to the sea bottom with a stalk are commonly called sea lilies, hence the name Lilip. The eep part of the name could be from the word creep then, as it creeps along the sea floor and does creepy things, like hunting by, quote, disguising itself as a seaweed by making its tentacles sway. Unsuspecting prey that come too close are swallowed whole. But also, other dex entries state that it disguises itself as a flower, not as seaweed. Uh, ocean flowers? Or maybe it's just referring to when the Mon happens to be on land, hmm? Well, the eep part could also be from the word peep, due to the fact that it seems to peek out from its little turtleneck, with its adorable yet terrifying void of a face. But also, also, the eep part could come from deep, because it lives on the deep ocean floor. Or it could be all three, because some Pokémon names are just so perfect and deep. Its Japanese name is Lilia, which is probably a combination of Lily and Lilac, the primary color of Lilip's body. And now, I've been putting it off long enough, I suppose. Let's get to those unnecessarily phallic tentacle things. Like, egad! Cradilly especially! Like, those are just a bunch of floppy wieners! If that's what your flesh pulls look like, you need to get yourself to a doctor. I suppose the tentacles do look partially like the tendrils on crinoids, but more so, it makes me think of sea anemones. After all, Lilip traps things with its tentacles and then swallows them whole, just like sea anemones do. And Cradilly, its evolution, swallows even bigger prey whole. Sea anemone are in the phylum Knindaria with a silent sea and are closely related to things like jellyfish, man o' war, and coral. So, they aren't even closely related to crinoids. Like, not even sort of kind of close, despite looking a lot like them. Lilip is only a bit like a sea anemone, whereas Cradily is basically sea anemone incarnate, but cranked up to ten. Sea anemone are normally pretty dormant, but most species are capable of moving, and they tend to do so every few weeks or months using their pedal disc, or foot. It's just like how Cradily moves around. Anemone can also get huge, like Yurtacina and Columiana and Stichodactylum mertensii, which both can exceed a meter in diameter. And Matridium farsimon can reach a meter in length. So Lilip being a meter and Cradily being 1.5 meters doesn't actually seem all that weird. But again, the, uh, interesting color choice Lilip and Cradily's tentacles have is, uh, hmm. Well, I guess it's a very similar color to the well-known types of sea anemones, like the one in Finding Nemo, but the fact that it's two-toned and looks like half of the population's favorite part is a bit weird. But at least it's also funny. I'm talking about penises. Sea anemones are like most sea creatures in that they are named after a land species that they put a watery word around. In this case, the name comes from anemones, a kind of flower, due to many sea anemone being brightly colored like their flower namesake, but like... Why anemone flowers specifically? There are plenty of brightly colored flowers to choose from! Uh, but yeah, I guess they do look kind of like the flowers from above. Kinda. 
If you squint and go cross-eyed a bit, well, maybe it has to do with the way that they flop about when the ocean current is strong. The word anemone comes from the Greek anemos, meaning wind. Anemones, the flower, are thought to only open when the wind is blowing them. So apply that logic to ocean currents, I guess. If we look at Cradily's Pokedex entries, it states that it roams around the ocean floor in search of food. This Pokemon freely extends its tree trunk-like neck and captures unwary prey using its eight tentacles, which like, that's basically an octopus, right? I mean, just replace extends tree trunk-like neck to stretches its whole dang body, and that's how octopi hunt. Oh yeah, and that somehow reminds me, do you want to see the weirdest thing Cray Dilly may be partially inspired by? And when I say weird, I mean weird predatory tunicates. Tunicats? Tunicates? Whatever. Look at this weirdo. Look at him and tell me there's a god! So, what exactly are we looking at? Well, their scientific name is Megalodicopia hyans, and they are basically a bear trap for tiny crustaceans and zooplankton alike. They live in the deep ocean, at about 183 to 1,000 meters down and they stay anchored along the deep sea canyon walls and seafloor. When something small happens to float into its mouth, which is actually a siphon, it snaps it shut and won't open again until the prey is fully digested. So it's just like a Venus flytrap, or like a cray dilly, or like the Darling Tonica Californica, aka the Cobra Lily, which we made a Bellsprout variant to one time. It's like a snake. Look at that. It's cute. Self promo. Uh, but actually, if we look at the Cobra Lily's flower, Cray Dilly looks a lot like their flowers, but the colors are reversed, and it's superimposed over the actual main plant, especially since their flowers tend to droop down and the leaves droop around the flower itself. It's a lot like how droopy Cray Dilly's head and neck are. Craw Dilly. Craw. Cray Craw Dilly. Co. Cobra Lily. Hmm. <laughs> Cray Dilly's head also looks a lot like a predatory tunicate's mouth almost all the way closed. This is double creepy when you consider that Cray Dilly is partially named after a cradle, and it also looks kind of like one if you squint and go cross-eyed a bit. And then its tentacles would be reminiscent of baby mobiles floating around on top of the baby's cradle, luring them in. And then BAM! You're being digested in the damp void. I mean, Cradily's name in Japanese is Yulado, which combines the Japanese words of lily and cradle with the English word cradle. And also consider the tunicates and the sea anemones and all sorts of stationary filter feeders. They primarily eat plankton, yes, but also baby fish, like small fry and baby crabs by the thousands each. They snap up the poor fish babies. How creepy. Now that was a surprising amount of stuff to talk about for what I always just thought of as just a phallic sea lily Pokemon line. It just goes to show you just how deep some Pokemon origins can go, except for Talonflame. Now we get to talk about my favorite fossil Pokemon line, Anorith and Armaldo, they ancient shrimp. Uh, oh, you wanted me to continue? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to find something. Uh. They have claws, because you get them from the claw fossil. There's that. But like, just look at them. They both so shy and polite. Armaldo totally uses those big meaty claw things to unironically do the uwu shy finger touch thing. And Anorith, it looks like your youngest, tiniest cousin staring at you wide-eyed, full of love and admiration because you're the only adult slash teen at the Thanksgiving table that gives the little kids positive attention instead of just shooing them away. <clears throat> Anyways, both of these dudes seem to be heavily based on an order of extinct very early relatives of arthropods called Radiodonta, and of those, they seem to be influenced the most by the genus Elemenopesis. Uh, I mean, Enamelocris. Anomaly Ocaries? Uh, uh, well, Enomalocaris translates to abnormal shrimp, which, like, look at him. Be a weirdo. But an adorable weirdo. I love this thing. Anomalocaris lived 520 to 499 million years ago during the early to mid Cambrian period and is thought to be one of the earliest examples of an apex predator. Yes, these eyes are the eyes of a killer. 
This seems to be reflected in the fact that Anorith grips its prey firmly between its two large claws. Firmly grasp it! And when it evolves into Armaldo, it still hunts like that with its extendable claws. But now it also has the power to punch right through a steel slab. Which is kinda heavy metal, dude. Like, what are you even hunting? Oh, right. Other Pokemon. The fact that they are one of the oldest apex predators is undoubtedly the reason they are a fossil Pokemon specifically, and not just a Pokemon based on an extinct thing. Also, they were incredibly successful and abundant for their time. And as we discussed in our video about the Gen 1 fossil Pokemon, being very successful and quite plentiful is a big thing for fossil Pokemon. And really just fossils as a whole. Anomalocaris grew up to 38 centimeters long, excluding the tail fan and frontal appendages, so Anorith's size of 0.7 meters isn't all that much of an exaggeration. It's just a jumbo shrimp. Tasty. Dip it in batter and fry it. Goes good with tartar sauce. Mmm, so good and tasty? Another animal that Game Freak was probably inspired by is the brine shrimp, which is the common name for Artemia, a genus of crustaceans that live in very salty lakes. So what are brine shrimp? Well, unless you're an aquarium enthusiast like my wife, or just really like shrimp, that name may sound unfamiliar to you. However, you might know them better as sea monkeys. Yeah, these things. But also, that's not entirely accurate, but mostly for capitalistic and pedantic reasons. Supposedly, according to the company that markets them, sea monkeys are an artificial breed known as Artemia nyos, N-Y-O-S, and they are formed by hybridizing different species of Artemia. They are also claimed to live longer and grow bigger than ordinary brine shrimp. However, in typical marketing fashion, there are no references to these claims outside of marketing from the manufacturer. So yeah, they're basically a patented breed of aquatic animal, just like glowfish. Now, brine shrimp don't look like much at first glance, but from far away, they look just like extremely small little feathers floating around in the water. But if you look really closely, you can see that they look kind of like Anorith. After all, they swim in a very pretty undulating sort of way, the same way that Anorith is described to swim, and the same way that Animalicaris are thought to have swum. And also, also, they make some of the best fish food because they're jam-packed with healthy fats and protein in such a tiny little space. Tasty. Dip them in batter and fry them. Goes good with tartar sauce. You just need like a couple thousand of them. Yeah. Naturally, brine shrimp are a clear white color, but they can turn a pink or red color when infected with tapeworms. Oh, yay! You see, the tapeworms do this on purpose. The red color makes these shrimp significantly more obvious to birds, which eat the brine shrimp, and then the tapeworm can continue its life cycle inside of the bird. How morbid. But it's relevant because if we look at Armaldo's shiny, it is a pink color, likely a reference to this morbid facet of brine shrimp life. Now here's a question, what do you get when you cross a shrimp with a regular dinosaur? Probably prison time, but also Armaldo. Armaldo looks very similar in body plan to carnivorous theropod dinosaurs, such as Tyrannosaurus rex and the Allosaurus. And it is a very good predator, just like them. Armaldo's name is most likely a combination of armor, relating to its armor, and old, an old Saxon word of meaning old. So if it's old to the Saxons, it must be pretty old. Like a fossil. The name also makes me think of a kind of sleazy but well-meaning Italian frat boy. But that's neither here nor there. But speaking of armor, I do see some similarities with real armor. Most obviously are its gauntlet claws. Well, those are just gauntlets with some exaggerated proportions. And claws. And then the whole thing looks a bit like Tose Gosuku armor, or samurai armor. There are many similarities, you see. Kinda. Uh, the large flaps on the back resemble arrow guards they often would have on their arms and possibly backs. And then, what about these feather-esque parts? Well, there were plenty of Tengu-themed armor sets, many of which would use feathers. But what's with that Saxon word for old being there, old? Well, let's take a quick gander at Saxon armor. Oh yes, it's... Eh... Not exactly Armaldo plate armor. They seemed to be more of a mail shirt and belt kind of soldier. Is it too much of a stretch to say that their back flap things kind of resemble Anglo-Saxon shields? Yeah, maybe. But also, their helmets were famous for that nose bridge and face shielding thing with the eye holes. Kinda like we see in the middle of Armaldo's face. Maybe. If you squint a little and go kinda cross-eyed. Hmm. 
I need to find, like, a medieval history nerd. Well, even if it's not intended to resemble any real armor directly, it itself is still armored, as it has a rocky exoskeleton. Because it's a dinosaur shrimp, and it's rock-type, and very defensive. So it has armor, uh, uh back to Anorith. Meanwhile, the if in Anorith's name is similar to lith, a common affix to many words, such as monolith, gastrolith, and megalith. Lith comes from the Greek lithos, meaning stone. And Anorith is a rock type. I'll let you connect those two dots yourself. But to add on to the rock type side of things, Anorith sounds a lot like anorthosite, which is a kind of igneous rock. And anorthosites are of enormous geologic interest because it's still not fully understood how they form. Which adds more credence to why Anorith is a fossil Pokemon, because paleontology and geology go hand in hand. Fun fact though, anorthosites make up the majority of the light colored parts of the moon. Oh, I hope this is far enough away from that guy. Shrimp! Oh. Shrimp! Oh. Shrimp! Shrimp! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All in all, while the Armaldo line looks super duper interesting, there just isn't that much to say about them compared to Cray Dilly, who eats a lot of shrimp all the time, even on the moon, I suppose. Well, what do you think should be added here? Let me know down below, and until next time, praise Anorith. And never stop using your noggin.